Uh, Y'all are probably wondering what we're doing here on this fine, hot day in July, all the way down here in Alabama. Uh, We're actually sitting on the porch of my family home, which is behind the Slab Lab. Uh, A few days ago, we suffered a major fish kill out here, and it's one that had several things that potentially could have caused it. It's never going to be just one thing out here with as hard as we push the limits on growing these fish. The weather, as of lately, has been aggressive and unusual, to say the least. Uh, But something about this one just felt different to me, and my good friend Heather uh, from Natural Waterscapes said, I'm getting on a plane and I'm coming. And she did within 24 hours. Lots of things we did out here today. And and some of you will really find this interesting. But before we jump into the sciencey stuff that we did, I thought it would be worthwhile in July in the South with the heat dome closing in to discuss what you as a pond owner can do in the case you have the worst happen, which is a fish kill. Right now, we are at a time for high risk of that with these incredibly warm water temps and air temps. Um, If you don't have proper aeration, if you've got heavy nutrient loads because you, like us, want to feed and grow big fish, you're in a high risk. So what do you do? There will be a time to talk about what you can do to prevent something like this. But right now, I think it's more important for us to share what you do in the event that this happens. So I think... Step one in most situations when you have a fish kill is learn from that fish kill, what happened. That's why we're here, because we can just start reacting. We can do things to rebuild the slab lab, but let's learn from it, because if we don't know all the factors that led this to where it's at today, then we know it's going to happen again, right? So... First and foremost, get your water tested. It's not that expensive. It's a small investment to know what's going on in your water. There are going to be things that are going to look worse than they did before um, because of the fish dying in the pond. But was there cyanobacteria like there is here? You know, what what are your nutrient levels? What's your pH looking like? All those things can play into what went wrong, but you don't know that unless you get your water tested. So I think first and foremost, find out what's in your water, what's going on so that you can get a baseline and then we can move forward from there with a plan to put in place to have long-term success so it doesn't happen again or the likelihood of it happening again is much lower. Maybe you won't be as caught off guard if you're monitoring your water quality. And that's something that we have faced here for years. We've always struggled with that, some of that. You know, dad and I have to own because we know we're pushing the limits. We know we were flying too close to the sun um, with what we do because we were taking big risks for big rewards. This is the price that we pay. Uh, There are a lot of things that we will be doing differently going forward, but I do think it's really important to share some tips about cleanup and things like that. If you are in the state of Alabama, I can confirm for you that DNR will not clean up your fish kill. Uh, It is your responsibility, whether you are public or private water, to remove those fish. And depending on how many fish you have that have died in that water, really decides if you should clean them up. If you've just got a handful, it's not that big of a deal. But if you've got hundreds or thousands, you need to get those fish out. Decomposing fish can degrade your water even more and even bring in a whole host of issues from parasites and unwanted wildlife. So it's the best thing that you can do. It's a little unfortunate in the situation that we're in right now because of the volume of mortality we experience from this event and the absolute and the terrible heat that we have here in Alabama we're kind of got our hands tied. We, we can't really get out there. We don't have a boat. All we have is two feet and a net, and, and we have tried to clean out and net out as much as possible, but the reality is right now we've got to let what's in there disintegrate. That brings me to another point. There are some things you can do to buffer or mitigate some of that damage from those decomposing fish. We've got some rapid back coming. Mm -hmm. I'd love for you to tell them what that rapid back is, Mm -hmm. why it's important, and what it does. Yeah, so 
when looking at problems where you have a lot of debris, and I mean organic debris, so in this instance, fish waste, but a lot of times it's organic muck that's building up, um, getting your ammonia levels down, breaking down all of the solids that are in the water is really important. And so there's a lot of different bacteria products on the market. The one that we're sending um, that's going to be used here this week is called Rapid Back, and it's a liquid bacteria product. The difference between using something like that and maybe uh, a powder or, so, or a puck that you put down in the bottom of the pond is it's going to react faster as part of its name, Rapid Back. So we want to get to work as soon as possible to get this water cleaned up, especially when you have high ammonia in water. Not every fish kill is going to be a complete fish kill. So it's so important and crucial to get those ammonia levels down as soon as possible. And whenever you have a fish kill, you are going to see an increase in that. So that is a really important thing. We also talked about muck pellets. Um, that's something that can help to start to break down what's at the bottom as these fish start to drop to the bottom so that we can start breaking down that waste as well. So our muck remover pellets, that's that's something you know for the future that we can look at as well. That's not a today thing for the slab lab, but that's something in most situations on smaller ponds that are seeing issues like this. Your, your muck pellets to break down the waste, they're wrapping back to get the ammonia levels down quickly is important. And then it's important to maintain those things as well. Mm -hmm. It's not a, we are going to do these treatments and then we're going to walk away and say the pond is clean and we're good. We do have to keep maintaining and doing lower levels uh, as, a, as a maintenance treatment to keep it so it doesn't happen again. Is that something like the rapid bat? Mm -hmm. Is that something that a pond owner can order? Like, do they have oh, yeah. to go in into the store? Can they? Where can they get it? How yeah, can they, they get can it? get that right at naturalwaterscapes.com. We have that on our website, um, and you you just get on. You buy however much product you need, and it ships out same day. If it's ordered up by I think two o'clock, and then they should get it in two to three business days. We've nice. got pretty quick turnaround time and if you need it quicker than that we do have express shipping options as well there's a couple of things you can do as a pond owner for preventative maintenance and one of the most important is like understanding your water mm -hmm. natural waterscapes makes it really easy the way that they send you the test kit you can it comes all in a box you fill up the container with your pond water you fill out your form it's got very easy instructions to read put it in the box, mail it back. It's so simple. And I actually sent Heather a water sample the day after the major fish kill out here. And I thought we were getting some results today. Did yeah, we get some? We did. I kind of want to talk about that okay. a little bit. I sure. don't want to go over anybody's head on this, sure. but these are the things that we are interested in and we are looking at to not only explain mm -hmm. what happened, mm -hmm. But how do we clean up and how do we do it in a way with the goal to rebuild our trophy bluegill fishery? So tell us a little bit about what that test result tested for and sure. what it showed. We test pH hardness. We look at the ammonia levels, which is really important. We look at the orthophosphate, which is what's available for things like the cyanobacteria to grow. And we look at the nitrate as well. On top of that, we also do a cyanobacteria screening as well, which we know you have, but not everybody knows they have. And it's something that's becoming so, so common in ponds all over the U.S. Whether you live in a northern cool climate or you live down in the deep south, it's everywhere. And we're seeing it earlier in the year um, and, and later at the end of the year, too. So um, this time of year, I would say four out of five samples we receive have cyanobacteria and most of which they think they just have algae growing in there or I pollen. Mean, yeah. Or pollen. You, you look at it and you think it's pollen or by in the film. South in July, you do not have pollen in your pond. <laughs> Let me make that very clear. <laughs> that should be cause for you to get a water sample safely. And I always recommend gloving up when you do it just to be on the safe side and when she sent me this test kit it actually included the gloves so I felt real scientific and special when I was collecting that water yeah, sample. Wear, wear the gloves. Yeah wear the gloves it's better to be safe than sorry. Uh, not all blooms are toxic but on the off chance you've got one it's the best way you can protect yourself and until you have confirmed what type of cyanobacteria you've got keep dogs pets, children's livestock away from your water. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the best advice I can give you. So yeah, once you get all the results, we, we process those the same day they come in and then we send them to our team that writes the reports 
and and then you should have those within another day or two from that. Um, you just get the pleasure of getting to hear them in person here. But normally within that water report, the other things you're going to find, which is something you aren't going to get necessarily if you're sending it to a state lab or something, is we're going to explain what it means. We're going to say, like, this is why we're measuring this. This is what it means. This little green means it's good. This this is red. That means it's bad. What do these things mean? And then we're going to break down. If you have cyanobacteria, we're going to show you pictures of exactly what we found. And then we're going to say what it is, what toxins it can produce. Doesn't mean it is right now, but it can. Um, and then we're going to do a step-by-step -step plan based on the size of your pond. We're going to measure it and we're going to tell you exactly what you need to fix it. Yeah. Both the short term. So things like cyanobacteria, I'd put that in a short-term maintenance plan that there are things that you need to react and treat now, but then there's long-term things that you just want to do every two weeks or every four weeks, depending on what it is to keep, more, keep it uh, More in line with like that preventative maintenance, yeah, right? Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, so you get all of that. It's, it's not that much money to do that. To yeah. have somebody come out to your property like we did today, um, that's a, that's a lot, you yeah. know, but for, for a homeowner, you can just do it yourself and you can learn so much. And you can have a happy pond again. Yeah. So, yeah. That's what we're, that's, that's always going to be the goal. Big yeah. fish are fantastic, but being able to have a place that you can sustain and mm -hmm. maintain yeah. to keep those memories being made and to keep catching fish. That's, that's the big goal for us on this next step. Not saying we're not going to grow big fish because that's what we're in the business of, but right. we're really looking forward to starting over. And that's what it's going to take out here. Um, it's a lot of cleanup, a lot of things that are just going to have to kind of sit and breathe for a little bit before we can get back to feeding fish and doing things the slab lab way. Uh, but I'm really glad that Heather came down to see me. It's like she heard the call and showed up and she has taught me so, so much. I, I mean, really like I, my head is spinning from all of the things that we have learned about and we've seen under the microscope because... Mm -hmm. She literally traveled with a microscope. I don't know. I think that's really cool. Uh, so there's there's going to be a lot more that we've got to dig in here too and, and really figure out. But just right now with the way this heat is going, and I know there's a lot of pond owners out there that are they're nervous. Um, you may have actual anxiety about it. I don't blame you with the way the weather is and the heat is going. You know, it's going to be important for you to know what to do in the event that you wake up one day and you've got floating fish. So clean up, most important, start to clean up. That's something you can do right then and there in the moment. Grab a water sample, get it sent to Heather and her team, let them analyze, let them see what's going on, let them see if there's rapid bite needed, what else you could do right now in the moment to make sure that you bring that water back the way it needs to be before you stock additional fish or try to continue a feeding program mm -hmm. if you've got fish left. Just go ahead and see. See where everything is. So yeah. awareness precedes change, and we got to know what we're dealing with. So, yeah. Hope you guys find that really useful and interesting, and there'll be a lot more to come. Thanks.